Beloved, will you pray with me? Almighty and wondrous God, we humble ourselves before you. For we have been hearing the prayers of the children, prayers of anguish and prayers of hope. Sometimes, God, we do not know how to respond to those prayers, and we wonder if you are hearing them too. Fill us with confidence this day, O God, that you are with us, that you do hear all of your children's prayers, and that you are seeking to respond in the ways that you know to be wise and compassionate. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Help us to know your mindfulness, your wisdom, your compassion and mercy your love and grace for ourselves and for others. Open us up to you. We cry out for a word from you this day, O God. We open ourselves to hear your message, your word, your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, I'm continuing in this sermon series that I'm calling Unraveled. Um, I've chatted with a few of you, so I know that some of you have been sort of having a similar journey to myself, but I obviously can't talk to everybody every week. So um, I'm hoping that some of you have been joining me on this idea of sort of exploring those moments where our life unravels and to see that as a part of life's journey, um, something that just happens along the way. Sometimes we make it happen. Sometimes others make it happen. Sometimes it's really no one's fault. Um, it's not a consequence. It's just a part of living. Um, and, and a way of thinking of unraveling is thinking about change. Um, you know, they can, they can be the same, but I would suggest that raveling, unravelings aren't always about change either. But this morning, as we consider the story of Saul and Ananias, I really want us to consider um, an unraveling that you can think of in two ways, and and I invite you to engage in whichever one really speaks to you this morning. You know where your heart is. You know where your journey with God is, and so you kind of choose the way you want to think of it. I'll refer to it probably both ways throughout the sermon, Um, but it's an unraveling of being wrong is one way that you might think of it, or an unraveling that invites us to discover a new path. Um, I would suggest that you can't really find a new path unless you're shifting from an old one. Um, And while the old path isn't always what we might define as wrong, it's it's kind of what Saul's journey really reckons with me. Um, He's not entirely wrong, but he is using what is right to harm others rather than to live in the love and grace of God. So let me dig into that for a moment. And I want to invite that Ananias is also also is asked to discover a whole new path. Um, so, so we're going to get it from both sides. It's not just uh, Saul that undergoes an unraveling in this moment. Ananias, I think, in some ways undergoes an even a, a different significant unraveling. Um, so I don't want to compare one to the other in strength necessarily. But to, I think sometimes we only focus on what happens with Saul. And I really want us to think about the choices that Ananias makes as well. I think both give us insights and both give us things to consider as we seek to also be disciples and to answer to the call of Jesus Christ to be sharing his gospel in the world. So so I kind of mentioned before I read the scripture reading, I kind of reminded you of who Saul is. And I'm going to, because he only is referred to as Saul in this passage, that's how I'm going to refer to him. It's not um, until, um, sorry, in the beginning of like the 13th chapter that I want to say that we start to hear him referred to as Paul. And then after that, he's strictly referred to as Paul. There's sort of a um, a significance in the name change. And we see that a lot in scripture, right? We remember Abram who becomes Abraham, uh, Sarai who becomes Sarah. It is not an uncommon thing for a person's name to be shifted or changed. And often it's just a, a slight shift, um, especially in the way they're translated in the English, but they are significant usually in their meaning. So imagine if you knew me as Amanda, and then you decided from henceforth to call me Mandy. Um, and while we think of those as nicknames, it could also be seen as a shift in my name. And if I, if I said to you, I've gone through this, 
And, you know, I really think of the previous person I was as Amanda, and I don't want to be known as Amanda because I'm really trying to make this change in my life. So will you call me Mandy from now on because the person I'm trying to embody is Mandy? Um, then you might change my name, you know, and that that new name might not just be a different variation of my name, but a, an embodiment of the new person I'm seeking to be. Um, we don't see that as as much um, in our culture these days, but it was very common back then for that to be part of, you're making a significant life change. Um, you, we see that a lot in scripture. So Saul is a faithful person. I want to start off by recognizing that before we get into um, the ways his faith has led him awry, and perhaps the ways that our faith leads us awry, to acknowledge um, in his heart he is a faithful person. He is someone who believes, he understands the, the, what we would call the law of God. He re, he knows the law of, of the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, he knows the preachings of the prophets. Um, he is a scholar um, in addition to being a faithful person. He would have been one of the men that would lead Bible studies in our modern world. He would be someone that when we had a question, how do you understand this? Saul would be a person we would go to. He, so he isn't evil um, in his nature. I think it can be um, easy to take someone's deeds that we might see as evil deeds and to assume, therefore, they have an evil heart. But I really don't see Saul in this light. I see him as someone who is passionately pursuing what he believes to be faithful pursuit of the law of God. And there are many who agree with him. And we might argue that he's been shaped by the, the leaders of the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, um, some of these leaders are the ones that play key roles um, in the gospel writings that tell us of, you know, the unfolding of Jesus's crucifixion. Um, and so he's been raised um, and, and has learned from some of those persons. And so I'm sure he's been influenced by that. Uh, but he believes he's being faithful. And in that faithfulness, he is arresting and participating in the execution of what we would now call Christians. They were called people of the way at the time because they were following the way of Christ. So when we hear that in the scripture reading, the people of the way, um, that's, you know, the, the, the title Christian doesn't yet exist in this moment. Um, that's a, a, a term that will come along um, in later years. And the reason for that is because really there are Gentiles and there are Jews. And so the Christians will sort of become a blending of future generations of both of those groups. But right now, um, they're still sort of divided in that way. And so, so Paul is particularly interested in finding Jews who ha have converted to the way, to, the, to being a disciple of Christ, because he sees them as standing in violation of the law. He does not understand yet that Jesus is the fulfillment of that law. He has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And so he is pursuing this very passionately. I just want to invite you for a moment, regardless, to ask yourselves, is there something that you are passionately pursuing in the name of God? You know, when we think about the convictions we have, and, and this is sort of more of a mental exercise than a physical one. I'm not suggesting, as far as I'm aware, none of you are arresting people and having them executed. But that is just one manifestation of, of passion and where it can take us. Um, but I, I just want you to think about, when you think about things that you would be willing to argue for, when you think about those hardcore moral, ethical, faithful stands that you take. This is right and this is wrong. Is there gray area? Sure. Are there circumstances? Sure. But at some point, we all know where the lines are of, I cannot go, this is my hard line. This is where I walk. And if you aren't going to walk this with me, I am right and you are wrong. And that's where, where Saul has found himself, right? This is what the law says. This is what you should be doing. You aren't doing it. Therefore, I am wrong. You are right. You are in violation. I will give you the opportunity to be different. And when you choose not to be different, I will persecute you. I will arrest you and have you executed for not living the way that I believe you should live. I think if we're honest with ourselves, all of us, myself included, and I'm not going to give personal examples this morning simply because I don't want to derail any of your own personal explorations. This isn't about us being the same. We all have these spaces within us, but to think about if I was sitting at a table with so-and-so, think about some of the people you hear perspectives from. You read about them in the newspapers. You see them on the TV. So you may not know 
actually be in relationship with some of the individuals that might occupy these spaces in our world. But I would imagine you can think of certain persons that if you had the opportunity to sit at a table with them and a chance for them to listen to you, you would be more than willing to explain to them exactly how you see their lives as wrong. You, and you might be able to quote scriptures around that. Um, you know, that, that you are seeking to, you know, in a faith, and then you might even think of yourself as, as helping that person. I want you to lead a godly life. And so therefore, I'm going to tell you about this. I'm going to tell you how you're wrong. And, and then you're going to see it my way and you're going to change and we'll go off together and life will be good. I think most of us, my, I mean, you all know me. I like being right. And dang it, I get a double genetic dose of that. Both my mother and my father, once they thought they were right, were incredibly stubborn um, and passionate about being right. And, um, and so there was a lot of fighting in my family, um, you know, between my parents and myself and each other, because it was very, it's very challenging for any of us that once we believe we're right to even consider the other opinion. So when I speak with all of you this morning, believe me when I tell you as usual, this has really sat on my heart this week. And it's been an exploration that I have been doing in response to this story and this unraveling that I see in scripture. And asking myself if there needs to be some unraveling in my own life. Um, and so I'm just inviting you to join along with me in that. So Saul has this amazing moment where, you know, and it's not a moment that we're all going to have. And so that's where the hard work for us comes in. You know, in some ways, in some ways, Saul gets off pretty easily, um, but he becomes the example. So we have to, but, you know, because most of us don't have a Damascus Road moment. We don't have a flash of light from the sky. We don't hear a voice that cries out from the, from the sky. We don't go blind and then are led to a faithful disciple who alleviates our blindness and then teaches us the error of our ways or shows us, um, teaches us new things and gives us a new path to follow. That is not usually what happens for many of us. Some of us have had experiences where we have heard the voice of God, but it is not typically this dramatic for many of us. And, and so I just want to acknowledge that, that so we are really called to do some of this work ourselves and to sort of continually, I believe, ask ourselves, how are we choosing to be faithful to scripture and to Jesus Christ? How are we determining where these lines are for us? How we understand this is the way of God and this is not the way of God. I think that's necessary. I, I don't think every behavior is the way of God. I do believe that I myself and you and everybody else are doing things that are the way God wants us to do them. And we are doing things that are not the way that God wants us to do them. And we can call these the way of God and sin. And that's really easy ways to kind of understand them and break them down. When, when we're doing what God would ask us to do and we're doing it the way God would ask us to do it, we are following the will of God. And when we aren't, we are sinning. There you go. I think one of the ways to help us distinguish between the way of God and sin, especially as we're dealing with what we think of as moral, ethical, faithful convictions, how do we know the difference and, and how do we identify that for ourselves in the world? And how do we not get bogged down in judgment, which is very clearly not the path that Christ wants us to take? Jesus speaks very frequently about hypocrisy and not judging others. We see that a lot in, in the gospel writings as Jesus speaks and preaches, encouraging people to leave judgment and vengeance in the hands of God, that only God has the ability to know a person so intimately, to be able to discern what is in that person's heart and to truly be able to judge. That no matter how well we know a person, no matter what we see in the evidence of their actions, we will never have the ability to know a person intimately enough and well enough to judge them and decide what should happen to that person. Whew, that is really tough. And so if we can't do that, then, then, then how do we navigate this road? And for me... One of the things to understand is that Saul is not sharing his convictions and asking people or inviting people to consider his convictions. He is using the law of the land, both within his Jewish community and in his Roman community. He kind of gets double power, which is a unique circumstance in this time. He is using the laws of his faith and the laws of his country to harm others 
to execute others. And to execute people that I think we could argue are no threat, no physical threat to society. So when we think about why should a person be convicted of a crime and, and, and imprisoned? Um, you know, I would argue that the reason for that would be protection. There are persons that have done things that are harming society, that are risking other persons in society. So if you are, if you have stolen, um, if you are um, raping, if you are murdering, you know, then you cannot be trusted to do that you won't do that again. And so we put you in a place where you don't have the opportunity to do those things to society. Um, that's the idea. And I know it's not a perfect system and we could get into prison reform another time, but you know, we put persons in a place where they're isolated from society. Um, and, and until they can prove themselves worthy to be trusted again, that's really the idea behind what we see in, in, the, in the scriptures and in our modern justice system is who needs to be separated from society because they cannot be an active participant without causing harm? So, so what happens, though, when persons aren't harming society? They're just in it, and we believe they're wrong. What happens? What does that look like? And right now, it's not too hard to think of some of those examples. Um, and you and I might be on opposite sides of some of those examples, and I understand that. And, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay. That I believe that we're never going to exist in a place where we all agree on, on everything. I'm not even sure that's the design of, of earthly life. But as we try to figure that out, how do we walk as faithful disciples without persecuting, arresting, and executing? And that's what Saul was doing. That's a very specific example. But I, I'd like you to just try to use your, your heart and your mind to explore the ways in which we do that all the time. Because you were wrong, you are not welcome in my home. Is that not a way of executing someone? Because you were wrong, you're not welcome in my church. You are not welcome in my community. Because you were wrong, I have no desire to know you at all. Because perhaps of this one wrong that I know, I believe that you have no value anymore as a human being until you correct this one wrong. We do take these stands, all of us. And then we begin to treat people in this way. And it is an execution of their heart and soul. It may not be a physical harming to their body. Sometimes it definitely is. We have seen this. We have seen this recently. We've seen it in the murder of George Floyd. We have seen this in the looting that has been happening. We have seen this in, you know, fires being started. We have seen physical damage happening on all sides, all parts of the spectrum of the issue of justice right now. And, and I would say that none of those are the way of God. Making your voice known in peaceful protest can be the way of God. Taking, you know, taking action in order to um, minimize the damage that a human being is doing in the world through the arresting of that person and, and the lawful um, conviction of that person is something that is sadly needed, but is, is, could be the way of God. These are not mutually exclusive things, and that's part of where we get ourselves bogged down in some of the issues right now. But when we think of the harms that we do to one another because we don't see them as a flawed and yet person in growth, which is the way we demand to be seen ourselves. If any one of us would make a mistake, if any one of us would discover that we are wrong, would we not demand upon persons that want to hold us back? You cannot continue to judge me by something I now realize I was wrong. You have to let me in. You, you have to let me leave that in the past and move forward. We are terrible at extending this to others in the ways that we would hope it would be extended to us. And this is where Saul has found himself. This is where he's found, he has become so rigid in his understanding of the way of God that there is no space for him to even see these other people as also faithful people that are trying to find the way of God because they are different than him, because they are doing things that are different than he understands the way of God, he condemns them. And that's what he's been doing. And finally, in this moment, as he goes to Damascus to really pursue this in this new area, Jesus says, enough is enough, and blinds him. 
I find it very, of all the senses that Jesus could have taken from Saul, I really want you to think about that. He could have taken his hearing. He could have taken his touch, his taste, his sense of smell. He could have totally taken all of them and made him completely unable to, to participate in the world. But he only takes his sight. He only says to him, stop seeing the world. Stop seeing these people the way you always have. And because you are so incapable of that, I am going to blind you. I'm going to literally take your sight so you have no choice, no choice but to stop seeing the world and my people this way. Stop it. I am blinding you so that you can see a new way but he doesn't take his ability to hear. Saul can still hear from these other persons. He just can't see them. Talk about an unraveling. I'm not sure we can even fully relate to what Saul is going through. While many of us have convictions, not all of us have dedicated our lives so fully to those convictions that if we discovered our conviction was a misinterpretation, how devastating that might be. That's really not addressed in this passage very fully. just seems very easy for Saul to go from one way to the other. But I'm going to encourage that behind the words in this passage this morning, there is a great deal of grief, an immense amount of prayer, and a wealth of grace and forgiveness that is given to Saul so that he can become this new person, an unraveling, an unraveling of being wrong, an unraveling that allows him to discover a new way, and I would argue a holier way, a way of love, a way of invitation. This will not be the last time that Paul finds himself in opposition of someone because of his faithful interpretation of Scripture. I want to remind you, if you are to read thoroughly the book of Acts and Letters, there are places where Paul goes, where he is kicked out, where he is it's attempted for him to be stoned, where people argue with him, where he is asked to leave. He is eventually imprisoned, and he himself will eventually suffer the same fate that he has been handing to others. So it will not be that he is now right and everybody will just see that. He will still continue to say, I am right and you are wrong. That'll still be, but he will no longer do it in a way that harms others, that closes others' paths to Christ. Instead, from this point forward, when he is stoned, he will turn away. When he is asked to leave, he will leave peacefully. No longer will he harm other persons. And to me, this is the real transformation in the grace that we see. That, this is the difference between being passionate in the will of God and asking for the grace of God to guide you and being passionate in ourselves and wanting to be right and wanting people to do it our way because it makes us comfortable and doing it our way because the idea that there could be a different way is so painful for us to consider that we are locked into it. It must be this way. It must be. Because if you tell me it is this way, my whole world will unravel and I cannot handle that. And so therefore, here is where I am. And we have examples of this throughout the history of the church uprisings and the uproarings that happened after Vatican II, when the Pope said, you can do the Mass in person's own language. We think of that as a natural thing. Of course, people need to be able to understand what is being said. And therefore, if you do not understand Latin or a different language, we should be providing the message of God, the worship of God, and the word of God in each person's own native language. This is why scripture has been, you know, uh, translated into thousands, hundreds of languages around the world, and why there are whole groups of people that their mission and their passion is to make those translations happen, to produce and publish those versions of Scripture and then get them out there so that a person can read in their own words the Word of God. This has become a basic idea, and yet, when the Pope said, you do not have to do a Mass in Latin, whew, that is a decision out of Vatican II that rocked the world at the time. And yes, we aren't all descendants of the Roman Catholic Church in our few generations, but we all trace back to you know, the original Christian communities that would become the Catholic Church um, and would be then split into Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox. So, so we see this so profoundly. And that's not the first time. I want you to even go back further. We can even think of scientific truths. I want you to envision what it would have been like to have been one of the people 
that argued fiercely and passionately that the world was flat because you just knew and that you saw that as a way of protecting people. If you do not behave as if the world is flat, you will fall off of it and you will perish. I am telling you, you must believe me and agree with me so that you don't die. Only to discover the world was not flat, that you can't fall off the edge of it. How, how would you reconcile that? And if you had harmed someone in the pursuit of that passionate knowledge, would you not grieve that? So as we consider our passions, to consider doing them within the grace of God, because I believe it is the will of God that we would not punish or persecute other persons no matter how wrong we think they are, that there is a criminal justice system and that we should utilize that in order to separate persons that are harming others in society, absolutely. And that they can then work in an isolated system that is still very imperfect, but that they can then do the work for redemption on, for the, of themselves and to prove themselves trustworthy. This is why we have sentences and why it's not always a lifelong sentence. You are then allowed to try again. And I believe that is a way that we can do this. Um, but when we are harming each other, when we are burning down each other's properties, it is not the way of God. When we are kneeling on someone's neck, physically or metaphorically or spiritually, so much so that we have cut off their ability to breathe and leave them on the ground under the weight of our bodies, it is not the way of God. It is no longer justice. It is fear and anger and we must let the world unravel in such a way that we can find new paths. And this is where we turn to Ananias. I love Ananias because he doesn't blindly follow. When, when God calls out to him, when Jesus says to him, I want you to go to Judas's house, and this is a different Judas than the disciple. That was a common name during this time. So, so just understand, he says, I want you to go to Straight Street, which I love that that's the name of the street, Straight Street. I'm going to go, you're, you're going to go set Paul straight. I mean, I just love it, right? So much great irony in this moment. You're going to go to Judas's house on Straight Street, and you are going to heal Paul because he's had a vision, and that's how this is going to happen. And then you're going to teach him, and he's going to become a disciple. And Ananias says to, to the Lord, he doesn't say, here I am. He doesn't say, you got it, I'm on my way. He says to him, um, excuse me, God, but Saul is, has been arresting members of my church. He came here to arrest people like me. And the hope of that arresting would be to take me to Jerusalem, to have me tried and convicted, and then for me to be executed just as you were. Um, no. <laughs> like, have, like, no, that's not what I want. And this is another way of denying Christ, right? And this is another unraveling. I mean, think of what Ananias is being asked to do. He is being asked to allow his preconceived notions of a person to unravel so that that person has an opportunity to grow into someone new. In some ways, I feel that Ananias' transformation is more difficult than Saul's. Because Ananias isn't wrong that he is right. That is exactly what Saul has shown up to do. But when the Lord says to him, I have seen this, and I'm telling you this is the way, Ananias says, then I leave it in your hands. I leave it in your hands. And he goes and he heals Saul and he teaches him. And I can't even imagine the amount of resistance that he and Saul experienced in the body. We're, we're told, as you continue to read through chapter 9 and into chapter 10, that the, the current disciples rejected him for quite a period of time until they, and they trying to run him out of town. And, you know, it's not a, just a peaceful, like, oh, now, oh, okay. Oh, Paul's one of us, and he said these things. Oh, then let's hold hands and we'll sing songs. No, there is a period of active resistance, a period of disbelief. And Saul is faithful in his pursuit of his new path. And Ananias is faithful in the persistence of his new path. And it is witnessing the two of them together and the the changes in both of them that allows the whole community to change. And eventually they will send Saul out and they will know him as Paul and they will allow him to be Paul. And he will be the main evangelist to the Gentiles of the world. And he will write sacred letters that guide our lives today. 
None of that would have happened if Ananias had not allowed his life to unravel. And you can bet he was scared. Is there anything more terrifying than facing your own persecutor? I want you to imagine that. You know there's a person who's in town. And their one desire is to arrest you and have you executed. And you get a message from the Lord that he wants you to go and heal them and then spend time with that person teaching them what you know and helping them grow as a disciple. Would you be willing to answer that call? Friends, I have to tell you, as much as I want to say yes, I don't know. That is a big, big ask. It would be a whole lot of fear. I think of some people in the world right now that I'm not fans of. And I'm not going to name them because I don't want it to be like that. But I can think of a few people that if God said, I want you to go heal this person and be in relationship with this person, my answer at first would be no. No, I don't want anything to do with that person. And the reason I know that I would feel that way is because I actually have very little or no faith or confidence that that person can change. And I think about the harm I can do to that person because that's how I see them. I'm not wrong, but I'm not right. I'm not fully a sinner, but I'm not following the way of God. I I might be right in my convictions. I, I might be right that this person is not following the way of God. But when God says to us, you have to see people with potential to grow and be different, not into what you think they should be, but into what I want them to be. We have to acknowledge that Ananias was also changed through this process. We don't get to read about that in scripture, but everything we know about being humans tells us that Ananias would have been greatly impacted in his interactions with Paul, that Ananias would have also become a stronger, more faithful disciple in his willingness to yield his convictions and his willingness to be faithful. You have two people who are being faithful, but are missing the will of God. Who are then brought together in relationship and between them, in both of them being willing to change, in both of them being willing to let their lives unravel, they find the true path of God that leads to discipleship, that leads to witnessing and evangelism, that leads to the changing of people's lives 2,000 years later. That's how powerful that unraveling is. And so I invite you this morning to see yourself in both Saul and Ananias and to really spend some time. This is a time of powerful and passionate convictions. But we cannot afford to be so locked down in those convictions that we begin to harm others. We cannot be so locked down in those convictions, that we do not invite others to be people. That we don't offer to them the grace that we would demand come our way. The opportunity to grow, the opportunity to, for them to say themselves, I see now. And maybe they'll never say that to us, and that's really the problem, isn't it? If we knew, if we knew what Ananias knew, if we knew that we could go and, okay, we'll say a prayer, and then that person will change and be different, we would do it. But if we knew that we would go and say a prayer and we would also be different, would we do it? If we knew that we would go and say a prayer and that person would not change, would we do it? But this is the call of discipleship. This is the story of Saul and Ananias. They each allow every conviction they have to unravel so that they might find a new path to the glory of God. If they persisted down the path that they were on, they both would have been faithful, but neither of them would have glorified God. Think about that, please. I've been asking myself all week and been having some very, very difficult conversations with myself and how I see other people, how I talk to other people, how I want other people to be. And I have not yet finished this journey. I am just on the beginnings of this work and I'm just asking you to join me in the process. But to ask myself, I believe I am faithful. I believe that. I believe you are faithful. 
I know you. I love you. You're, you're my, my, my community of faith. You're my people that I turn to. I look to you sometimes to show me what it means to be faithful, and I know you look to me for the same. So I believe that we are faithful. I believe that we have hearts that desire good. But are we sure that the path of faithfulness we're on is glorifying God? is seeking to uphold God's will? Or is it a path that's seeking to glorify ourselves and glorify our will and glorify our need to be right and someone else's need to be wrong? None of us are right and none of us are wrong. We are all both. We are all both. We are all both Saul and Ananias. Do we have the courage to let our faithfulness transform into discipleship and to allow that new path of discipleship to put us in relationship with people we don't even want to be in the same room with. That We're not even sure if we were in the same room, we could hold ourselves back from acts of violence. Are we willing to take that path on the opportunity, the hope, the chance that God's grace might also pour out upon them just as it's poured out upon us? I don't know. I want to say yes. I want you to say yes. But I think we have to start by really looking at the path we're on and asking ourselves, is it the path that God has put us on? And to look at the paths of others and to not see them as paths that are running in opposite directions or even running parallel, but paths that weave back and forth and interact with us And to see that person just as we see ourselves. To see that person the way that we hope God sees us as a person still a work in progress. A person who might also be vehemently and passionately trying to pursue the glory of God and is both right and wrong. I am right. I am wrong. You are right. You are wrong. Maybe that's a way to build our relationships together. It doesn't have to be one way or the other. Would it not make sense if we're all created in the image of God, that we will find God in weaving ourselves together, taking your rights and my rights, your wrongs and my wrongs, taking redemption and compassion and transformation and the grace and love of God and weaving them into a new way of being? But when we enter into relationships with people, we already assume they will be right and they will be wrong, just as I will be right and I will be wrong. And rather than seeking to be right, we seek for God to be right. That our hopes in the world is for God to lead everyone. And our desire is for God to continue to reveal his way for each and every one of us individually and collectively as community. Amen. Beloved, will you pray with me? In a world of violence and tumult, we turn to you, O God. You are our strength and our protector, the source of comfort and peace. We pray for those who are oppressed. Defend them with your love and bring them comfort in times of trial. We pray for the poor and needy whose daily struggles overwhelm them. Stir up within us a passion for justice that we might serve you as we work for righteousness. When warfare threatens the powerless, defend them by your might and bring your peace to all the nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is going to be Amazing Grace because it resonates with me that it comes in some relationship to this passage. I was blind, but now I see. Perhaps if we were going to write it, I saw, then I was blind. Then I saw anew. And so as we celebrate and worship this hymn together, I invite you 
Allow yourself to be blind. To take a moment and pull back. To stop seeing the world you, the way you do. To stop seeing people the way you do. And then to seek to open your eyes anew. That is the amazing grace of God. It is not something we can do as human beings. It is only something we can do through the grace of God. It is only something through the gift and love that we know in the embodiment in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is in that gift of grace that we can be transformed and that we can be transformed alongside others. So, beloved, I send you forth. May you be blind so that you can see. May you know the love and grace of God. May you glorify God in all you say, in all you do, and in everything you are.